Okay. Good day everyone. This presentation is a continuation on the fundamentals of computing systems. In this video, we shall, in particular, look into expanding the address range of our basic DRAM memory module. Now in the early days when the first microprocessors were developed, just like in our basic microprocessor, they utilized a single wire to address each memory row. But then very quickly they faced the problem of finding space on the CPU casing to draw new wires. Thus, for example, it became more and more challenging to draw the such of 64, 128 or 256 wires from a single CPU casing. Thus the problem cropped up of not being able to expand the memory beyond a certain limit, which was solely dictated by the physical dimensions of the CPU casing. Thus in this presentation, we shall look at the solution the engineers came up with to resolve this technical problem. So first of all, let's recap on how we currently address memory. So observe that in the current configuration, at any given time only one memory address line will be on. Thus, in this configuration, as we only have 16 lines in the address bus, we will only be able to address 16 memory locations, but obviously, there will be serious limitations on what one can achieve with just 16 memory addresses. So now let's go back to our program counter, and let's implement a few modifications. Thus now our new program counter, which we shall call version B or version binary, will utilize the binary number system or binary notation to address the memory. Thus observe that when we want to address the first memory location, we keep all the lines at low voltages or at binary zero. Next, when we want to address the second memory location, we keep the first line at a high voltage or at binary 1. Then to address memory location 3, we use the binary number 2. And to address memory location 4, we use binary number 3, where the first two lines are kept at a high. And to address memory location 6, we use binary 5. Now let's go back to our memory unit and see how this new notation will work out on the memory unit side. Thus now, as we are using the binary notation, the first problem we encounter is that when the program counter has used the binary zero to address the first memory location, as none of the lines of the address bus are at a high, the memory unit will have no way of knowing which memory address to refer to. And now, when binary number 3 has been placed onto the address bus, the memory unit encounters yet another problem. For how is the memory unit supposed to figure out which memory line needs to be activated, as now we have more than one address lines at high or active state? And yet again, for binary 5 as well, we encounter the same issue. So what could we do to resolve this issue? Well, if our new program counter use binary encoding to encode the address, then like so, we should also be able to use a decoder to decode this binary value and uniquely identify which memory line corresponds to the binary value currently in the address bus. And thus we will now disconnect the address bus from our memory module and connect it to an address decoder. This address decoder will in turn decode the binary value in the address bus and uniquely identify which memory line needs to be activated. And now, before looking into the implementation details of the address decoder, we will take a short detour to describe the basic functionality of the logic AND gate and the logic NOT gate. For the interest of those whom are new to digital circuits, and if you are already familiar with logic gates, feel free to skip to the next section. Observe that the AND logic gate is equivalent to two switches connected in series. Thus, for the output to be energized both the input switches will have to be switched on. Thus the AND logic gate will only produce a high output, only if all its inputs are high. On the other hand, 
a knot will inverse the input. Thus, if we apply a low input to a knot gate, its output will be high, and if we apply a high input to a knot gate, its output will be low. Now for this demo, for simplicity purposes, we use mechanical actuators to implement the logic gates. In a future video we shall look on how to implement logic gates using the such of transistors. And now let's implement our address decoder, using the above logic gates. Now we will let the viewer visualize and deduct how the logic gates given here will uniquely identify the binary number 0 and activate the first memory location when the binary pattern corresponding to number 0 has been placed in the address bus. Next, Observe how the given logic gates will uniquely identify the binary pattern corresponding to number 1. Now, with the next few address decoders, observe and identify the key role the NOT gates play in uniquely identifying the binary numbers. In other words, identify where one needs to apply the NOT gates and where one does not need to. And now, with binary number 5 in the address bus, validate or double-check as to whether the pattern you identified is correct or gets applied correctly. Another point to note here is that the circuit we have implemented for address decoding uses a leftmost least significant bit. Thus, if one is interested, conceptualize on what circuit modifications will be required to have a circuit where the least significant bit is on the right-hand side. And as another optional exercise, try to identify a redundant element in our address decoder circuit, which we can remove, without causing any effect to the final result. Removal of this redundant element will also save a lot of space from the address decoder. One will find a hint for this identification at the end of the description section of this video. And now that we have implemented this address decoder, observe that we are no longer restricted to the 16 memory addresses we were confronted with in the initial design. Thus with a 16-line address bus, we can represent or address memory locations from decimal 0 to up to decimal 65535, which will be more than enough for the tasks we shall look into in this series. Thus observe that by utilizing binary encoding, we have succeeded to increase the addressable memory range from 16 to well over 65,000, which is a significant improvement. Thus, in this video we demonstrated one practical application of data encoding and decoding. In the next video of this series, we shall look into another associated circuit, which is a multiplexer circuit. Using this multiplexer, we will be able to connect more than one memory module to our CPU. For example, if one takes a look at a DDR memory unit that are used in home computers, one will observe 8 to 16 DRAM modules. And these memory modules are connected to the address bus using the technique of multiplexing. And then next, we shall look into how to use data encoding to store characters of the English alphabet, utilizing ASCII encoding. Thus, for example, in our DRAM memory module video, to store the English capital A character, we had to use about seven memory lines. But using ASCII encoding, we can reduce this to just one line of memory. Reflect how much of memory this will save, for example, in the case where a document has 10,000 characters. But the issue of using ASCII encoding is that when we require to display this encoded document in a computer screen, for example, we need to figure out a way to convert this code back into a pattern that is recognizable to humans. And this is where the such of font files comes into the picture. And this is why 
we went through all of this trouble of increasing the capacity of out memory module because to store a font file of an alphabet, 16 lines of memory would be totally inadequate. And that brings us to the end of this video. And as always, if you did enjoy this video or found its content useful, do give us a like, and also don't forget to subscribe. Okay then, have a nice day, and see you in our next video. Bye.